god, talk about timing, eh? Well, hello YouTube, it's me Fortmaster, and welcome to what is part three of device theory. So, I mean, Molly sure has one hell of a sense of timing on this, or, well, that and also there's the combination of me just taking a long time to get the things, because on the day that I was editing my reaction to part two of the theory, Molly put up uh, part three. And if that wasn't enough, part three is six hours and 31 minutes long. Well, technically 32, but who, who's gonna count five seconds? <laughs> so, uh, if it wasn't clear before, this is going to be a multi-part reaction, though it's gonna be different than my previous multi-part reactions. Um, because I'm not going to be recording this in one session. Again, because again, the video is six and a half hours long, uh, and who has that much time to sit down and watch a video of that length in one sitting? But, but, thankfully, Molly has graced us with an intermission halfway through the video. Thank you. So here's how this is going to work. The, uh, I'm going to watch the video up to the intermission, then I'm going to start recording, start editing, and then, probably either tomorrow or the day after, I'll sit down and watch the rest of the video. Now, I'm not going to release the uh, all... I don't know how many parts of this in one day. I'll release first watch section, and then second watch section probably on different days. Hopefully not that far apart if I get... if I, you know, don't mess up it at all. But, oh god, yeah. We're finally here after... The first one was about half hour and a half, two, then two and a half. So, just over four hours of what you could call preamble, we finally have the theory itself. So, yeah. Of course, as always, original video will be linked in the description if you haven't seen it yet for some reason. Corner video will lead to my Let's Play of the Day, as well as, you know, the, the next part in this whole... shebang. I don't even know what other word to call it. <laughs> but yeah. <sighs> this has been a long time coming. Let's finally get into this. <sighs> Yo, this is the third and final part of a three-part series I of hope. Made of Deltarune's <laughs> meta-narrative. Parts 1 and 2 both discuss the entirety of my findings in Deltarune as a whole, from certain secrets, both well-known and obscure, to the sweepstakes, to other non-game material, to internal data, to even user interfaces and menus to try to figure out what Deltarune's message might be. Yeah, this, this part thing will be going goes over deep. the theory I've made to try to put all of my findings together, so if you're not too savvy on Undertale Deltarune lore and easter eggs, have not played the games, or just in general have no idea what I'm talking about, I strongly recommend you watch at least part 1, but part 2 as well would be ideal. There is a lot I go over from here on, so I don't want you to be too confused. Oh, and aside from Undertale Deltarune spoilers, obviously, there will also be spoilers for a few other things in this video aside from them. More specifically, the general plot of the video game known as Super Hot and what? the SCP-2614 page. But either way, I can't CP2614? really stop you. I'm just telling you in advance that this is where I go completely off my rocker. If you'd like to watch the previous parts, there will be some cards and links in the description taking you there. I know this is a long series, but analyzing an entire game Okay, wait, 2614? I haven't heard of that one before. What is it? SCP-2614 is a DVD copy of the fifth season of the television drama The Sopranos. Uh, the disc itself is moderately scratched, consistent with the deterioration, uh, with deterioration after heavy use. Uh, the object does not bear any marks of origin, although the words bookshelf written in black marker obscure the title logo on the top face. When played, 2614 is not anonymous unless an action performed during a scene where a character is watching the film blacked out. If the play button is pressed on any working remote device, the viewer is granted control of the camera view from the device's directional pad and center button used for forward movement. The camera is free moving and fully maneuverable. Uh, upon the presence of this action, it is not possible to revert uh, to the previous non anomalous state unless ejecting the object and thoroughly cleaning with isopropyl alcohol? Okay. After assuming control of the camera, the show setting will begin to elapse uh, uh, in real time. As such, characters have been observed continuing uh, to continue interacting 
after what would normally have been a scene transition. It is not possible to fast forward or rewind, judging by the apparent in-universe data at the outset, the user would have to wait three days and 14 hours to navigate the camera to a strip club uh, known to be frequented by the associates of the DeMio family in order to uh, present, uh, to be present for the next chronological broadcast scene. Okay, so this gets weird. Okay. Huh. Looking for something this specific tends to kind of cause that. Actually, you think it's being more specific would lead to it being more, you know, compact and less rambly. Either way, though, get comfy, and without further Try ado, my best. we shall now finally discuss the device theory. That, that's that really does sound cool, though. That that sound effect. Now, I'd like to make something clear before we go any further. This has been, by far, the hardest part of the series for me to really put together. For all of you what, the actual waiting, theory? this has taken forever for me to get around to because making a proper, cohesive, and most of all understandable theory with all of the information that I presented in the previous parts is no easy task. In order to make this make any goddamn sense, I not only will have to explain what the theory is, but my goal is to also explain what this theory would actually add to the game and its narrative and message if it were to be true. Which, I mean, given that we haven't even been told what the theory itself is yet! The theory itself is just one hurdle where several more are to come after it, and because of that, my main struggle is making sure that this video doesn't just turn into me rambling about random, vaguely related details and going so off the rails that it becomes hard to follow. What, you so, haven't been already? To remedy this, I decided no. to structure this part in a more unique way, making subsections of this one more or less. In specific, there are six sections that we'll be going through, each one being revealed as we get to them. Obviously, this first section will be going over just what the theory is before anything else so that we're all on the same page and can understand through what lens exactly I'm trying to analyze Deltarune's meta-narrative in. But okay, thank you. But even go into that, I'd like to also set a couple of things straight just for clarification's sake. For one thing, while I have put a lot of work and thought into this theory to make sure it makes as much sense as possible, I'd like to also take a moment to say that my intention is not to convince you that I am entirely, certainly right. There are people who are likely going to disagree with my take on the game. There are going to be leaps in this part where I can't fully prove certain things as much as I'm just going with my own preference for what I think will work better. For example, I may believe that the player is directly diegetic and important to the game's story. However, other people may believe that they're indirectly diegetic or just not diegetic at all. Because we are in oh, pure God. theory land now, I can't give you only objective info. This theory does hinge on some unanswered questions having uncertain but confident answers. Such comes with the territory of theorizing and speculating about currently incomplete game projects and the like. I yeah. may believe some things to be way more likely than other things, but if you think I'm dead wrong, or if you have a wildly different take, then all the power to you. I personally have a lot of confidence in this theory, but that doesn't mean that I am convinced of it being a the end all be all, or that it's truly what Toby is going for. Hell, I'm not even trying to predict anything super specific that may happen in the game, like literal bosses and whole cutscenes and the like. At least, not necessarily. If what I am about to say is all true, then the very most I could predict is the direction the game will go in tonally, the general message of the game, character motivations, and perhaps some elements of what will become the game's ending in a thematic sense. But I don't know what that ending truly is, and I don't know what Toby truly is trying to say with Deltarin, nor am I trying to parse that from him. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, again, uh, we're chapter two out of, what, seven? Uh, what is the actual percentage of that? That's not even like that's not a quarter. Before. That's just, that's just over a quarter, right? Because you know it's seven instead of eight. Actually, let me, let me try to do the math here. Yeah, t twenty-eight, basically twenty-eight and a half percent. Okay. At the end of the day, that would be trying to figure out what fever dream Toby had that led him to making Deltarune. And I don't know about you, but oh, that's a pretty yeah, fucking tall right. task even for me to attempt pulling. So, yeah, I completely forgot that the end of Deltrune was created in a dream, after. right? Take this as purely just a what if. That is what this kind of theorizing is at its core to me, and we're not here to get into flame wars about who's right and wrong. You maybe not, but I am. Stick him up. 
I may be more passionate and more confident about some things being a certain way, but just about every interpretation has merit to it, no matter how nonsensical. And for another thing too, because I won't know when this video is actually going to be out until I'm about 99% done with editing, but I'd like to also say that because I am this far in the series, I am now automatically immune to any and all whataboutisms you might want to throw at me. <laughs> Toby says something about Deltarune in a newsletter that suddenly recontextualizes a lot of things. Too bad, too late. I'm not about to just make a sudden segment to talk about it. We are too far in to make corrections now. Poor cowboy. There's one little thing in the Valentine's newsletter, but I'll get there when I get there. Another okay. theorist suddenly unearthed something mind-blowing about the game that I wasn't aware of prior to writing this? Cool. But I'm gonna save that shit for another video. Too bad, too late. And let me guess, is that one gonna be 10 hours long? Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop harping on about that. I, I know. The one thing I, you know, can't... Uh, the one thing I don't understand about, you know, like, projects like this is... <sighs> Well, I mean, just for the simple fact that, like, it can't be easy on you, right? Like, you, literally, you could have split up this one video into, like, several, and then it's it's a lot more measured, it's a lot more easier to put stuff out, because you're not putting out something that's, like, several times the length of an entire feature film. Toby releases chapters 3 and 4 while I'm working on this very <laughs> video? <laughs> right, no, yeah. shit, that's a sign I took way too long to finish this thing, but what am I gonna do? Just stop? No. That'd be fucking stupid. We are in the home stretch, and god damn it, we're gonna wrap it back around and finish this series if it kills me for crying it's out loud. It's gonna be an Ouroboros eating its own tail! Is in a post chapter 2 and post sweepstakes world, but in a pre chapters 3 and 4 world. How that ends up dating everything, how off the mark I end up being because of info that comes out right as I am working on the ending to this series, is future me's problem and is ultimately up to the angel itself. I am working purely off of what I've covered and analyzed in the first two parts of the series, and any analysis I can make about what comes after, I'd rather just save for another video or a few. But, with all of that out of the way, and without further ado, we can finally get into the meat of this section. And to start, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Yeah, what is the device this device theory? Is a box. Dear God. There's more. No. As I discussed at the very beginning of this series, everything outside of this box is reality. Or, yeah. at the most specific, simply the platform that programs rest on. And everything within this box is a software of some kind, or a program. But, with everything that we've now discussed, let's apply this to Deltarune. Everything outside the box is the platform that you are playing Deltarune on. It can be your computer, your game console, a TI-84. If it can run a program, then it works. Now, going into the green box is where we begin to enter Deltarune as the program. Keep in mind that I refer to Deltarune here as the literal .exe file that launches the game. Not the world that you associate the name Deltarune with. Not the lore, the characters, the story, or anything that makes Deltarune what it is on a narrative or gameplay level. We're not quite there yet, but this distinction is important. For reference sake, because I will be referring it with this name a lot throughout the rest of this video, the green box is what I like to call the program layer. Or, to put it another way, this is what I believe Gaster programmed himself. This is all that he made for you specifically. And if you recall okay. the ADCAPS files from part 1, this is where they operate from. More particularly, the chapter select, the save menus, the goner maker, dog check, the title screens and animations and logos associated, the game over screens, even the unused scripts, these are all the program's code. As nearly every single all caps file in the game relates to just these things. We do have friend as an exception, but we'll oh get to Oh god, them yeah, him, that little Point weirdo. Is, the device theory proposes that the all caps files and the way that they are coded is the program's code. It is separate from the way that everything else in the game is named in the files because this is not just Toby and company's code, narratively speaking, this is Gaster's code. Recall that in both releases of the game right, so far, okay. Gaster himself has prefaces releases, the 2018 demo literally being called a survey program. And if the version number doesn't convince you that we're working with his own creation here, then I don't know what will. Emphasis has been placed on the fact that the man himself made this program for you. 
Whether or not you consider the Twitter takeovers to be canon to the story, the Goner Maker and Game Over sequences, at least in Chapter 1, including even the pre-completion save menu, suggest that Gaster takes a great interest in the soul, or in other words, the player in their actions. And the fact that he is the first thing we see, before even getting into the game proper, and the character that we have to answer to if we get a Game Over at any point, all of this together makes a pretty strong case in my opinion for Gaster being the creator of Deltarune as an executable as a program. I put emphasis on that because I'd like for you to not think of this as me saying that I think Gaster is behind Deltarune as a whole. The device theory is not claiming that everything in the game and every character and plot beat and setting is Gaster's creation and that the experiment is actually some kind of simulation being run on Gaster OS or whatever. There's a reason why the rest of the game is coded normally compared to the LCAPS files. If you remember what I said in part 1, my claim isn't that Deltarune is simulating the entire reality that the game is in. This theory's foundation defines a program not just as a software running on your platform, but as something that can connect you to another thing. If you were talking about any other kind of program, this can mean connecting to the internet or some other online client. But Deltarune takes this differently, in the form of the to another connection world. Gaster refers to at the beginning of the Goner Maker sequence. It's the first thing that is even mentioned by him and in the entire experience, is asking if we are connected, if some kind of connection has been made between the player and the game. Before going any further, my point is that the program is the bridge between our world and Deltarune's world. Whether that be light or dark, this program was made with the purpose of connecting us to Deltarune's world at the bare minimum. But, of course, how does that work? How can we connect to Deltarune's world just by opening this program, and how does Gaster know that we are connected? What intricate mechanisms run this device's programming? Oh, the pinball video! Yeah, I remember that one! Well, we only need one such mechanism. So... This heart-shaped object. This whole time, I've casually referred to the soul as the player, because, as far as we know, there is no other equally likely candidate for who the soul represents. We could say this soul might have belonged to Chris originally, and that may very well be the case, but to stay as objective as possible, let's just say that we don't know who the soul really belongs to at the beginning of the game, and that for all intents and purposes, it's just there to be a thing for the player to control, that it is at least our soul in terms of it being the one that responds to our inputs. One can make the case that it seems outlandish to imply that Gaster just has our soul and that he <laughs> literally got to take and examine our soul from the real world into the program. But who's saying that Gaster is the one doing the work there? He simply made the program, but we're the ones that are connecting to it. And while there isn't some server we know of that is taking us to this other world, I believe that we don't need that. In fact, I believe that we're already doing it right now. Through a little something we call... The suspension, suspension of, of disbelief. disbelief, or... Okay, so bef before Molly gets further into that, the whole thing... It was, there was something in the back of my mind I was trying to remember, but I just remembered it. So this whole thing about, you know, connecting to another universe through a, like, through a computer program or something like that. I know it had, it doesn't have very much at all to do with, Under, uh, with Undertale or Deltarune or anything, but I remember this old creepypasta story I read years ago at this point if i uh if i remember correctly, i think it was called like the other internet or something but basically you know guy goes out to an abandoned lab and in the lab there's just like this old random you know ethernet port in the wall looks like it's been damaged from somebody forcefully pulling out a plug from it and not properly unplugging it and when he plugs his laptop into it to you know actually connect to it it turns out that it's a connection to the internet of an alternate re of an, like an alternate dimension and just how like that universe is like a lot worse or something like that if i remember correctly i think like at, at like assassinations of the u.s president were quite uh were quite common because it was seen as a way of gaining power or something like that it's you know it was it was you know that kind of like oh bad reality sort of deal and then at the end of the story, he also gets scared because obviously he started, he tripped something while he was looking around on the other internet and, uh, and, and, and a program like was being forcefully installed on his laptop, like a spy program or something. Uh, and just the idea of this other internet potentially finding out about our world and stuff like that, just all, this, all sort of scary. Uh, I know, again, doesn't have much to do with the with the device theory, 
But I just wanted to say that because the first thing that came to my mind when when the thought of program connecting to an alternate dimension comes to mind. <laughs> To be specific in definition, one's ability to emotionally and mentally tether oneself to a piece of fiction, to whatever severity that may yield. After all, what is suspension of disbelief? What is immersion if not its own form of connection? Undertale already has toyed with the idea of immersion in video oh, yeah, games, Flowey, Flowey being right. an example of someone who had eventually completely lost the suspension of disbelief for his own world. The act alone of suspending it has been acknowledged by the games as something diegetic, or at least instrumental to its narrative. I believe Gasser knows this, and he made this program not to take our soul by some force of his own, but to make it all the more convenient for us to hand it to him. I feel Deltarune's meta-narrative and fundamentals in which it operates on, at least under this theory, hinge on the fact that this game is not simulating a reality, but rather is connecting us to something and taking advantage of our suspension of disbelief and using that as a means of connection. It is deconstructing that very idea of connecting to a piece of fiction on such a personal level and making that its main driving force for how your existence in this game's world is justified. To me, it is the Deltarune equivalent to what saving and loading is in Undertale and how that justifies the persistent nature of the player's existence. And to me at least, that sounds kind of insane. How can yeah, a game use such a thing against the player, you may ask? How could separating the game as an executable from the game as a world and story be deconstructed to say something meaningful? Well, uh -oh. there is another game that happens to do just that. Super. Oh, super hot. hot. Super 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 hot. It's one of those games I've wanted to play forever. Uh never gotten around to it. Do I, do I even own Super Hot? Let me double check this, because I could have sworn I bought it at some point. Oh, I do own Super Hot. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's one of those games. You know what? I should, I should probably play that on the channel at some point. Five years, it's been that long. Super Hot is an FPS series where time only moves when you Series? Move. The series so far has three games, but for this video, I'll be only focusing on the original game that released in 2016. Oh, I had heard about the VR Super Hot, but I thought that was just a VR remake of the original game. Okay. There isn't much to say about it at its core, other than I think it's a really good game and truly the, the most innovative shooter I've played in years. But the oh gameplay God, those itself ads. goes without much explanation. The goal is to just progress through minimalist levels and shoot the red guys before they get a one-shot on you. But we're not here to talk about Super Hot's gameplay, or the core game of it in general, necessarily. What I want to focus on here... is the menus. Much of Super Hot's story doesn't actually quite take place in the levels themselves. A good bit of it does, but I'd say a lot more of it happens... here. When you open this game, instead of being shown the kind of menu you'd expect from any other game, you're instead met with a unique operating system. You can look through some settings, watch videos and trailers, run some demos, Jeez, screen resolution savers, is play that? a mini game or two, even look at a hacking chat room. And Super Hot, as the game that you know it for, is just one of those many applications. A crack that a friend sent to you that just seemed kind of cool. Over the course of the game, you play through it, but you're booted out a few times once the game realizes you're not supposed to have access to it. <laughs> However, later on, after being stubborn enough to keep playing it anyway, you're more directly shown by the game, or rather, the system for lack of a better name, that Super Hot is not just any old game. It's a tool. It's something with more significant consequences to it in reality, which they prove to you in the form of making you go to the exact place that you're playing the game in and making you hit yourself pretty hard in the head. For a good bit, the system continues to insist that you stop playing. It alters your messages to your friend, making it seem like you don't want to share the password to the game. It forces you to play at tutorial level and nail in that you don't have any control over yourself in this program. It even forces you after a certain point to actually, actually just literally quit, quit okay. the game, not letting you pick any other option. But you can't help yourself. You just want to get back into the game. 
even when you know you shouldn't, you open the game again. And the system sees your insistence on just wanting more, and it gives you more. Except now, it takes you into its own, as you realize your mind is leaving the body that you are playing the game on. Eventually, you reach what is known as the core, and using a new ability that allows you to occasionally swap to another person and control them instead, you hot switch into the core to try to upload your mind into it. And after enough attempts, it works, with only one thing left to do. Go back to where you're playing super hot and terminate your own body so that your mind exists only as software to be assimilated into the system itself. Ooh, then, okay. All that's left is to continue playing super hot forever and spread the word about it to others so they can potentially do the same. I'd go more in depth into what the hell the story of the game really is, and I might have some details mixed up admittedly because it is a little bit vague in some places, but that's at least the gist of it, and I'm not here to make a video essay series on a whole other game. You're not here to make another uh, video essay series yet. Never count yourself out. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Superhot is literally just like a Deltarune in its entirety, or that this is even remotely useful for predicting anything in the latter, or that they have anything to do with each other in a way that would benefit theorycrafting for Deltarune's lore. The story and the themes are certainly different, although Very I could so, make yes. the case that the two wouldn't be that far off and Superhot really is just what would happen in Deltarune if Gaster was actually evil like people may assume him to be. But Superhot <laughs> has its own meta-narrative, and similarly to Deltarune, one that hinges on the actual program that you open being separate from the core game that you end up playing. You don't immediately open the game itself upon launch, you instead open an OS menu. And in both cases, that distinction is important, because it allows the game to have world building beyond the game itself, and adds a bit more depth behind some aspects of the game that would be hard to address otherwise. For Superhot, it's used to touch on the game's broader theme of how people are drawn into games and become progressively more invested in them and their surrounding communities and more particularly the darker side of that, where eventually people may feel addicted to it or like they can't get enough of it, even if it puts their actual life on the line, and results yeah. in the player becoming completely detached from not just their reality, but their physical body in the game's story. As you play through Superhot, you, the player, become more invested in it and just want more of it. And, in fact, your reward for getting through the story is unlocking the endless mode and challenges. Oh, okay. You become freed by the system, by getting access to more of the game. That same access that you were lacking, which led to it booting you out at the beginning. Okay. So, the whole unlimited run at the end is gi diegetic into the game itself. Okay. Okay. Through having this degree of separation between the core game and the program itself just being an operating system that happens to connect you to Superhot, the story is able to be told effectively. If it were not for this distinction being made, Superhot would just be a game where you shoot red guys and time moves when you move, and that would really be it. And yeah. any attempt to tell the story that it told without that separation would have felt flat, or at least it wouldn't be as likely to actually connect to the player as efficiently as it does. I don't think you would feel as addressed if it weren't for the game opening with this menu, and the game itself just being one of the many things accessible in that menu, having the menu be its own OS, forces you to acknowledge it as more than just a screen you have to skip through in order to get to the meat of it. Moments like your own messages being rewritten by the system to take away agency from what you want to say, or looking into that chat room after finding all the secret terminals to see how the system is telling the moderator to act and telling them what to do to get more people invested in Superhot, or the game actually needing to be closed and reopened just to do that sick as hell animation of you going into the game and then stopping in the middle of it and forcing you to walk the rest of the way into a more pixelated version of the jail cell room, none of that would be possible and none of the game's themes would feel as fleshed out if the game wasn't structured the way that it was. And while it does it much differently than Deltarune, it does in fact fuck with your suspension of disbelief just as much, yeah, by taking does, advantage definitely. of that feeling of just wanting to play more of it. You're eventually forced to acknowledge that it's your own investment and suspension of this belief that's fueling this connection to the system to only grow stronger, even when it initially tries to ward you off. By allowing the core game to be sandboxed within the program narratively, rather than being the program itself, you're forced to grapple with the fact that you are engaging with a software, with something that you have to connect to, with something that to you at least is fictional. You have to make the conscious choice to not only open it on your platform, but to keep going through the program and to open the game yourself, and be aware of how that goes against the system's suggestions at first. And by deconstructing that idea, the game eventually uses your insistence on seeing more of it against you. 
super hot for whatever flaws it may have with the length of the story is a game that separates the program from the core game excellently. And when you look at how Deltarune's menus have been designed so far, even with it going for something completely different, clearly there is something to be said about the fact that in order to deconstruct the idea of interacting with the software or with fiction in video games, you need to split that hair just a bit. By going with the logic that Superhot may have gone by, the program in Deltarune isn't the world itself. It's the launcher. It's the OS that allows you to connect to each chapter in each save file, like you would connect to any game that you would have in your Steam library. And given that we know Toby and company are intending on the chapter select operating like a launcher app, even if at least just for optimization's sake, I'm only more convinced that this is all by design. Help, if I wanted to okay. reach, even the fact that we don't see the legend cutscene, or any of the intro animations for the game for that matter, until we pick a chapter, and the fact that the game just immediately throws you into the chapter select and waits for you to launch one of them so to speak, feels like something that this design choice would have been the catalyst for. The device theory proposes that Gaster did not make Deltarune's world. He's just made it easy for us to connect to it through the program that he made. Or, in other words, the device that he made. So, for those who may have been asking this whole time and to finally answer what the question actually is the device theory? the series poses, yes, the Deltarune executable itself is in fact the device that I speak of. Pack it up now, case closed, you finally got your answer, and I can see for you but... Hmm... That's not the whole theory. Yeah, Though that is I would imagine. one of the major cornerstones of it, which I think all the evidence I've so far presented makes a very solid case in favor of. If we want to go any further with this theory, we have to not just look at this box from a software and technical perspective, but a narrative one. After all, everything within this box is not only a software, but in the context of Deltarune, everything within it is fiction. It's a fictional world. The program itself, while it serves a more technical purpose, is still a fictional one, and one that requires you to suspend your disbelief. And the second that we are about to fully immerse ourselves into the vessel we had made in the Goner Maker, which had a presentation, text, potential narrative, and overall style that is completely foreign to the rest of the core game outside of menus, that vessel and our answers are discarded, supposedly, as we are shunted into the body of Chris and sent into the other side of this connection the light world, which in this diagram is represented with the yellow box. And in the light world, the UI is designed to be as close to, if not entirely identical, to Undertale's UI. Yeah. Obviously, this was done to further the first impression that Toby intended for the game to feel like Undertale 2 when first playing it, which is why he has referred to it as just a game you can play after beating Undertale. But beyond that, I think there is something substantial to the fact that from this point on, just about everything you see on screen when taken apart in the files is coded completely normally compared to the program layer. I get the feeling from this that the Garner Maker was designed to be something that you would eventually have on the back of your mind or even forget or about as you continue back. playing the game, as you get more invested in what Chris and their peers are up to. As far as the player should be concerned, Deltarune's story starts in this bedroom. It starts with Toriel waking Chris up. And everything before that just doesn't fit in, at least not currently. It doesn't seem relevant at all to what's happening in the light world. Not to mention that nowhere else in the game outside of the main menus does it ever look or play like the Goner Maker does. No, For yeah, as much exactly. As this is all in one executable, it certainly feels different from the much more technical, scientific, and otherworldly undertones that the Goner Maker had to be giving. From this point forward, the game's lore and world actually become relevant, because this is what the program was connecting us to, or rather, this is where our suspension of disbelief is being put into good use. So, with that alone, that is rather simple. You have Deltarune the executable, and Deltarune the world itself. The former connects to the latter, and the latter is sort of sandboxed in the former, as you're able to connect to different instances of it through the chapter select and save menus. Under the device theory's logic, this is about where it would end, and really, it wouldn't be a complex ordeal at all. But then you get to the dark world, represented by this cyan box, and it plays differently. The menu is completely different. The aesthetic, the dialogue, text boxes, the character portraits, the inventory, other UI elements, the existence of configuration settings, the battle <laughs> system, everything is fundamentally different. The Dark World even has its own story, not entirely separate, but mostly detached from the more grand stuff happening in the Light World. 
out there, there's just some mundane, if not rather stressful or worrying occurrences in hometown, and there's more of a focus on Chris's relationship with it, and the complicated feelings they and their peers may have about it. That's it. Hometown is a soap opera. <laughs> but here, there's this prophecy. A balance of light and dark. Fountains to seal. A knight who's creating these fountains and throwing the balance off. The story is so much more fantasy-like here, you wouldn't even think at first that it would have anything to do with Hometown. And as I touched on it back in part one, it becomes clear that the Dark World is meant to function like its own game in a way, and it's meant to be the meat of Deltarune. But you have to be in the Light World first, because in the story of the game, Dark Worlds are made via a fountain. And the Dark Worlds are treated as something like a dream. Not completely imaginary, but they have an air of escapism to them. Like, you're not in another world entirely, you're just kind of detached from reality in the Dark World. Because what's happening here is that the people who live in the Yellow Box don't know that the Green Box exists, so they believe that they are real and that the Cyan Box, the Dark World, is isn't. Not real. Just like how we perceive our own world as real and everything within these boxes as fictional. And for the program, which Gaster resides in, in this strange in-between of worlds that he's found himself, he may very well perceive the world of Deltarune as fictional too, and sees himself as a real entity, but that's up for debate. Oh god, you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of another SCP. Now this one, I don't remember what the number of it is. If anybody recognizes it, make sure to leave it in the comments so I can, you know, actually remember it. But it was a, um... Uh, it was a, a SCP where it it it, re it, w it really went into this whole like layers of narrative depth, so to speak, where like the whole SCP was the SCP Foundation trying to like contain this guy who was going basically going through apotheosis, like he was be almost becoming a god, basically. Um, but he was going like one step beyond because this guy had been created for the sole reason by the author of the article uh, to be a being that could transcend the various layers of uh, of uh, the various narrative layers of power um because I, i'm forgetting what the actual word is uh, but they have something they actually have a term for that in scp uh, where basically like oh you know if you have like say like a god in you know, say like a god in the Marvel Universe or something like that, or, or... They're, you know, obviously a god, they're gonna be super powerful, able to manipulate the, the universe in, you know, whatever ways, but said god of the Marvel Universe is still weaker than the author of the story that they appear in, because the author created the god. And then that kind of goes down where if you have a television show in the, like, the Marvel Universe, then, like, all the characters there, even just the normal nobody, will have more power than anybody in the in that show, and, and down and down, and vice versa, up and up. So, I mean... Color me intrigued by the fact that you have what is seemingly us being sort of partially injected into what is, for lack of a better word, a lower level entity, i.e. Chris. But to them, it's like they're a fictional world to us, but to them, but, but to themselves, they're the real world and we're like some sort of weird outside invader or something like that that's sort of just almost eldritch in nature it's really weird and that may be the whole thing too because like of course the whole story with gaster was that he was like like after an experiment or something he fell into his machine and he was seemingly like destroyed or like spread everywhere but maybe instead of just being spread everywhere, he was kind of put in between layers almost, where he's able to he's able to see outside of his original layer, but he's also able to see the layer of his creators. And he, you know, being the scientist, he wants to experiment and say, oh, if that happens, like, can we go 
Like, can we, how many layers can we go through with this, then? Hmm. Okay, that could be it, something. Although, you may now notice something else as I've gotten over the gist of what each layer of this game is like. Between the program, the light world, and the dark world, all of them present themselves completely differently from each other. The light and dark worlds play differently, and each layer believes itself to be reality where everything made in the boxes within it is fictional. Yeah. The existence of another layer requires something to occur in the current layer in order for it to be accessible. Also, I literally just re uh, realized this also could all this could also play into the whole thing of, you know, the believing that the universe itself is a simulation. It <laughs> Not to mention, every one of these layers presents its own plotline. The program with Gaster's connection to and interest in the player and whatever his experiments may be for. The Light World with Chris and company dealing with their own problems regarding their families, growing closer bonds and friendships, and generally coming to terms with potential trauma from a time long past and hard times in the present and near future. And the Dark World, with its story of the balance of light and dark being thrown off, fulfilling a long-told prophecy, and the long cast of eccentric characters that may aid or prove to be a challenge to the fun game. Yeah. All of these are their own narratives, but they're not completely independent of each other. In fact, most of them even exist within other ongoing plot lines. Do you see what's happening? We are dealing with a nested narrative. There are multiple layers of fiction occurring at once because any given layer believes itself to be- It's a frame story, but in any case refers to some form of main narrative setting the stage uh, for several other narratives being told within itself. ...be real and is making, or at least participating, in its own fiction. Or in other words, in entering the dark world from the light, we are playing a game within a game. Oh god. But it's with inception. that established- Naturally, we have to ask, if this is how the game's structure and meta-narrative is building itself so far, how much further can we go? What's the next step? Where are we going with this in the long term? So before I go any further, and to better illustrate what a nested narrative means for Deltarin, I'd like to take another detour. Oh, the okay, SCP we're talking about Foundation. the SCP, okay. If you have had your finger on the pulse of internet horror for any period of time, I'd be shocked if you haven't at least heard a bit about this project. Oh god, yeah, In I've heard about the SCP terms, Foundation the for SCP years. The SCP Foundation is a community project involving a fictional research facility that documents the containment, testing, and features of several anomalous entities, each one being named under a specific SCP number. Most famously, there's ones like this peanut-looking thing that doesn't actually use this design anymore technically because of copyright reasons, but this <laughs> yeah. thing that snaps your neck if you aren't blatantly looking at it with your eyes peeled. Or this thing. Don't worry 96. if you can't see what I'm talking about. You're about to get a good look at it very shortly, but... Okay, yeah, so, um, for those of you that don't know what SCP-96 is, um, if I remember correctly, I think the name of it was The Shy Guy? But basically, he's like a... what was he? He was like a seven or eight foot tall, really skinny, really emaciated humanoid thing that's always just in the fetal position, like, rocking back and forth, crying, covering its face and all that. Um, but what happens is if you or anybody else sees his face, he goes into a blind rage, and but keep in mind this is if you see his face anywhere, in real life, photograph, I think the only thing that doesn't uh, that doesn't affect him is like drawings. Yeah, he gets angry and he will uh, stop at nothing to uh, get you and uh, murder you in several uh, disgusting ways, if not all of them. So with that picture that Molly showed, uh, that was a whole thing where, like, it shows how truly dangerous 96 is, um, just given the, by the fact that the, uh, that 96 was literally just two pixels in that photograph. It, like, you wouldn't even be able to tell that you saw 96. And yet, one of those pixels was evidently 96's face, and he doesn't like the fact that you saw it. And the whole thing with 96 is, once he gets going, he apparently can't be stopped. I believe there was a tale or some story somebody made where, as just to try to get rid of him, they threw 96 into the sun, 
And then it's sort of like a last minute test to see if he was finally like dead. They they uh, they looked at a picture of his face, and then the sun started moving closer to Earth. So I, I don't think that's canon, but you kind of get the whole gist of it, right? I want to bring up a specific one for what I'm going to talk about, which is SCP-2614, or sometimes I go out in pity for myself. This is a seemingly completely normal DVD copy of Season 5 of The Sopranos. If watching it normally, there's nothing weird about it at all. Unless you happen to press play on a specific scene where a character is watching some film that's censored in the article. But upon doing so, you become able to basically take the camera anywhere you want, essentially entering a free roam mode, albeit with the lack of an ability to no clip. However, that's not all that this camera is capable of. If you decide to take it to any television or screen that happens to be showing some other kind of film or show or some visual media on it, you can end up leaving the Sopranos' universe and going into that one instead, accessing a fictional media within oh a fictional media. That's how For this the is working. Of this article, okay. There is a mix of experimenting with just leaving the camera in different areas in the Sopranos, but also a lot of testing with this ability to go into other fictional universes. They enter 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Wizard of Oz, The Simpsons, a commercial for laundry detergent, <laughs> an mp3 visualization on Windows. But to me, it's the last bit of testing that's especially relevant. Here, they decided to test a theory, that if you can go into a fictional universe, and that one happens to also have its own fiction in it, then in theory, you could continue entering fictional universes within universes and into. so on, okay. They start by entering Sandman, a popular serial drama in The Sopranos. Then, a popular TV show in the Sandman universe called Carolyn Carolyn. Then, a slasher film that plays in an abandoned home in that TV show called Snakebite. Then, in a scene in that movie, they enter a romantic film with its name classified in the article and some information now being expunged. And at this point... Uh-oh, things start to go wrong. ...to a deep red color. All in-universe lighting is affected. City appears uninhabited. Sky is black and devoid of stars, although a dark red glow has been observed on the horizon in all directions. Every TV they could find in this romantic film's universe is now just static. So, the researchers decide to enter one of them. And upon doing so, the static begins to resolve itself, this article describing it like the POV moving through a cloud or field of static. But then... POV eventually appears in a brightly lit hallway. All directional movement is restricted except for forward travel. As the POV advances, the image becomes more saturated. Oh god, what is this? What's going on? Oh no! And from there, we don't know what happened after. At least, probably not unless you do some much deeper digging into the larger lore of the SCP Foundation and into oh God, like fucking yeah. pataphysics or something. But well, let's just let's just bring this back on track. Just a uh, like a little tidbit of knowledge for anybody who has not gone into SCP before and wants to. Uh, just remember, there is no singular canon in the SCP Foundation. There are many and multiple. So don't worry if info in one article conflicts with another because you can just imagine they're from literal, literally different dimensions. What I just described is an example of just how deep the Nesta narrative idea can go. And furthermore, I think it may share some similarities with how Deltarun is handling this idea, more specifically in how the Dark Worlds work. In the sweepstakes segment, I touched a lot on how Deltarun has been so far using its own fiction to refer to itself. Dragon Blazers most especially does this, and just about every mention of it, it alludes to things that either have happened in Deltarun, or could at least have very striking parallels drawn to it that may indirectly foreshadow events to occur later in the game. Mm -hmm. And Noelle especially seems weirdly connected to this, as she even comments on Dragon Blazers' combat working similarly to the Dark Worlds. We also have Cat Petters, which, while cat not petters. as apparent in the game the so beepers. far, does connect to both Spamton and the eggs that can be found from the man behind the tree. Man, I st again, I still hope we get, like, a Dragon Blazers-themed world at Noelle's house with all of her video game stuff. Oh, that I'd I want to see how referential this game can get. In both cases, the fictional media in Deltarune plays a key role in forming the Dark Worlds. And if not that, then inanimate objects and concepts in general and even people's thoughts tend to shape a dark world and its theming. 
-hmm. this diagram even, I could technically group dragon blazers, cat petters, and even the board and card games and internet in the light world as their own smaller boxes in this yellow box, which all come They're together all to form the dark, dark world. Worlds. And the connections between darkness and fiction are very apparent here, but I'm going to touch on that in just a bit. With all of this in mind, as well as the other themes that I'm going to touch on later, it's obvious to say that the concept of interacting with fiction and engaging with it is a central theme of Deltarin. Through not- You know, I just realized that whole thing of when you, uh, when like Chris or anybody else jumps into a dark world, the whole thing with like the squares going through them, that's almost eerily similar to the ones that were seen in, uh, uh, in Superhot, isn't it? Just examining how we interact with it, but how the Lightners interact with it, and how fictional characters are treated in general. And this connection to fiction has been examined rather closely in both chapters so far. In fact, not just in how they interact with it, but how they create it, too. After all, one of the main driving factors behind a Dark World's creation is known to be the will of the Fountain's creator. So far, the Knight has been the one behind both the Card Kingdom and Cyberworld, and they both fundamentally play rather similarly even despite the different themes. And we don't really know how the Castletown Fountain was made, but I'm willing to doubt that the Knight was behind that one's creation, as it seems to have existed for longer, and it does play rather differently from the other Dark Worlds since it functions more like a hub currently. And, at least assuming that Chris isn't the knight, I personally don't think that they are, but this isn't the video for that, and given what Toby has said about Chapter 3 so far being a lot more gimmicky and unusual compared to most of the other chapters in design, it wouldn't surprise me if the, so far, only Dark World in the game not made by the knight ends up having a very different approach to how you go about playing it. That said, I do still consider all the Dark Worlds to be on the same level of fictional depth, because regardless of what playstyle a Dark World may have, you still access it from the Light World immediately, and fundamentally, it doesn't diverge from what the Dark World has set itself up to be from the start. Oh, okay. It's the next world getting really gimmicky, potentially because Chris was the one that, that created it instead of the Knight. Oh, okay. And, okay, wait a second, I just thought of something. That could also potentially be the reason why, apart from being in, like, the Castletown Dark World, seemingly, you know, the whole thing with, like, Darkers not being able to survive outside of their Dark World and then, you know, turning to stone and stuff like that. Because it, it could be literally that they're, you know, fictional characters that have been removed from... From their creator's creativity, I guess you could say, being that being the Dark Fountain. Now that just now that just asks so many questions about what makes Castletown so special. Huh. The actual RPG part of the game, whereas the Light World is more focused on just going around and talking to people and the world building side of things. But that's exactly the thing. If the game has already been structured in such a way to where the fictional media in its reality is being used to create a whole other reality of its own, and one that plays completely differently from how it would otherwise, being its own world to unpack from the one that you were just in, why just stop there? Especially given what we know about Gaster, and especially if he created this program, you why wouldn't see how the natural far conclusion you can to go. this design philosophy be to test, to experiment on this, by asking just one question? How much more fictional can you get than fiction? Or, in other words, how much darker can you get, get than, dark. than dark? And that is the other major function of this program to me. The device theory proposes that at least one of the functions of this program is not too unlike that DVD of The Sopranos. Something that can be played normally, but is capable of taking you much, much deeper into a fictional world if you so choose. And not only that, but much like that SCP that asked that same question, I personally think Deltarin is seeking to find its own answer to just that. And the device theory, if true, would be an essential piece in that. After all, you need something to help better visualize the sheer inception fuckery that this kind of thing could cause. So of course, why not have that something be in the form of a program that is separate from the world of Deltarin, and that blatantly uses the fiction in its own fiction to create more of it? And even with all of that, there are still a few things to go over that help add to, and I believe strengthen the device theory just a bit more. 
To go back a bit, I've already touched on the fact that the all caps files were named as such and almost exclusively refer to stuff in the menus and stuff that's outside of the core game. Mm -hmm. But there's technically two exceptions, those being friend and unused. And both of them, in my opinion, play incredibly strongly into this theory being true. Let's start with unused. The fact alone that this fucking script exists at all is all the evidence I'd actually need to be convinced that the files have to be part of the narrative. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's the whole thing of these potentially being, like, Noelle's sister Des trapped. Wait, that could be it. She got- she's trapped because she went too deep. Like, somehow, she was- she went darker than dark, and now she's stuck. Let's not forget that after Undertale's release, Toby had tried to warn against people leaking stuff in the files, and yet, of course, people did it anyway. Yeah, but yeah, of course they always do. Him, the unused script gives us a peek at a character lost in the program layer who we haven't even met yet. Were it not for this, a rather considerable piece of the larger story behind Deltarin would just go completely unnoticed. And you may go and say that technically that isn't the case because Spampton does have the moment in the shop where he does indirectly, or I guess in the Japanese translation, directly quotes the unused script. But how true is that really? If this supposedly unused dialogue was never in the files, how would we know he was even quoting anyone in particular beyond what he says after that? Let alone, how would we even think to see that as anything important? In some way, digging into the files has weirdly become part of this game's larger narrative, and if Deltarin is intended to separate itself as a program from itself as a world, then that would certainly help aid that by giving the program something like this to find, just about as far away from playing the core game as you can possibly get through data mining. Let me clarify, though, that I'm not saying that Toby is requiring people to go into the files to understand oh God, the game's narrative. I, I hope not. I'm sure that as the game goes on, it will reference unused more frequently, and that the presence of that script is just there for those who really want to go digging deeper, and get just a little nugget of extra lore in advance. But the fact that he left this in at all, and titled it in all caps, is still reinforcing how the menus and that general layer of the game are meant to be separate from the core of Deltarune. And friend? Given that they're the only other all caps file that doesn't appear in the menus, but is the only one that appears in the core game, that already has its own huge implications. The name alone, like the way it only appears in an already very off the beam path sort the of area, itself. and the fact that it appears just out of reach before disappearing, the only real takeaway you could get from this is that this is a character who exists on the same level as Gastrum exists currently, or perhaps even nearly on the same level as the player. Or, you know, for all for all we know, it might literally just be Gaster. And if that were true, then it wouldn't even be the only case of a character being more self-aware of the nature of the program that the player is using. Just look at Ralze. Everything <laughs> I said about him in part two pretty much shows that a lot of the time when he's referring to Chris, he's really referring oh to the player more likely. And even by a darkener's standards of self-awareness, he knows a concerning amount about what the player sees and has an advanced amount of control over what we can see on occasion, when he exercises that power to take advantage of it by talking to Chris off screen. Or I guess for a lesser example of this that could be reaching a bit, what about Sham and the fact that one of the first things they say is how you pronounce their name, as if they know <laughs> that they're speaking into a text box? Or the fact that Lancer is also aware of player controls just like Valse? Or the two secret bosses so far having some kind of direct understanding of the player's end of things. Jevil believing he is the only one that exists outside and free from the limitations of the dark world in the only room in the game so far to seemingly use 3D graphics. And Spamton constantly aiming to be just as powerful as the player, being held back by strings that take on nearly the same color as the battle box and pre-completion save menu for chapter 1. Or the fact that just before Spamton Neo is the one case ever so far where our soul changes. And not just that, but changes in reaction to something that we wouldn't have been able to avoid before, and even gives us a tutorial to get acquainted with it in complete darkness. And if we wanted to talk about the battles, there is something to be said about the fact that the Dark World in some way may also see itself as fictional, and may be self-aware of that fact, especially when a lot of the time that self-awareness shows in the battle system, which can have some parallels drawn to how things in the program layer are presented, even if not coded in all caps. Whatever angle I look at it, I have only become more convinced over time that a lot of the strange things that happen in this game, and strange design and presentation choices, become suddenly so much clearer when looking at it through the angle of Deltarune, not just as a game running on our computer, but as a program that has connected us to another world, and the worlds that it makes within it. 
And for both friend and unused, and all of the characters so far that know way more than they probably should, what makes them so strange only begins to make sense to me when I think of each of these cases in the context of the device theory, in the context of the program being its own layer beyond everything else in the game, with the purpose of seeing just how much deeper into fiction we can go. An unused script being part of the narrative can only make sense if the program itself is part of the narrative. A character existing on the same layer as the menus in Goner Maker can only make sense if it has become aware of the layer that the program is made in and had it manipulated to its benefit. And a character having to go through so much effort to guide the player and to shift their perspective, and to have other characters acknowledge the weirdness of that character's behavior by talking to some higher force, only truly makes sense to me if this character knows that some kind of program exists that he is able to manipulate if need be. To sum all of this up, the device theory proposes that Deltarune's meta-narrative is structured in such a way to where the game as an executable is separate from the game as a story and unique world. And more specifically, that this executable, or let's say, device, was made by Gaster for the player, by using their suspension of disbelief as a means of connecting them to Deltarune's world, whether that be through the soul literally being the player's, or the soul just being a means of projecting that suspension easily. In doing this, it allows Deltarune to have three narratives happening simultaneously, those being Gaster's story, the Light World story, and the Dark Worlds, each one being nested in the previous, and being effectively their own games that play and operate differently from each other. Furthermore, the very executable itself and menus are diegetic to the game, as the program that allows us to be connected to Deltarune has been created in a space between worlds. A space in between that might have more than just us in it, and that other characters in Deltarune may be well aware of for better or worse. This device that Gaster made is not only the reason that the player can connect to Deltarune and exist in it, but given everything we've seen so far, I believe it is a tangible object in the game's larger story and one that allows the player to go deeper into fiction. Okay. So, um, oh god, you know what? I just imagined, so the, uh, the potential idea of, you know, making you know, a dark world in a dark world, so to speak, that could potentially be where um, I talked about in the, in the last part, when I was reacting to part two, where, like, oh, future, like, maybe, like, one of the future Deltarune games has, like, drastically different gameplay, like it's 3D and it's first person or something like that. Like, mmm, that would be so weird. Or maybe you had one that was like entirely based around racing somehow. Oh, that'd be so weird. And then, it's been in the world, the device in the world, that could potentially mean that the end of the game might be us destroying the machine or the device, as it were, to free Chris from our control. Jeez, what would happen from there? And this theory proposes that we will eventually be able to go beyond even the dark world in terms of fictional depth and see how this tangible object, this device, which is fueled by our own narrative investment, will be acknowledged, or perhaps even used against us, in the future. Oh if no. If the device theory is true, then it makes this game not just a story about escapism and how people interact with fiction and treat fictional characters, but it would make Deltarune a game about taking your suspension of disbelief and throwing it into the nearest screen as hard as possible. Exactly, like uh, the, the, the whole thing with like the, um, uh, with the Dark Worlds, yeah. Just to see what might happen. After all, was that not what Toby had intended with even the very beginning of this game's story? And there's our answer. After all of this time, that is what the device theory is at its core. That's what it all has been building up to and why I needed all of this context in order to get around to making the theory itself. Because even I needed to have a much larger grasp of the game before I could feel confident in it, and even as I'm saying all of this, I still feel unsure if I got this theory across just right. But to some extent, this theory is finally out of my head after all these years. And since you got what you came for, I suppose there's nothing more to really add. That's all from me. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. Because even I needed to have a much larger grasp of the game before I could feel confident in it. Oh god, where is this going? I still feel unsure if I got this theory across. Oh, lights warning. Oh no. But to some extent, this theory is finally out of my head. After all these years.
And since we got what you came for, I suppose there's nothing more to really add. That's all from me. Is what I would say if I was a pussy. Oh god. See, I've talked about the theory. I've gone over what I'm actually trying to propose and how I got to that conclusion and what is ultimately my own personal, ideal view of what the game's meta narrative could pan out to be. But what then? What should you, the viewer, gain from this? What's the point of this possibly being true? What answers can we actually find from going with this philosophy? And what should you take away from the game and its potential message if this is how its meta narrative is structured? I don't want to just end this analysis off on simply giving you my theory and calling it a series. We went through two entire chapters and then some worth of material. For fuck's sake, this series isn't even solely called a device theory. It's Deltarune in, in the, the fourth, fourth wall. wall. This theory is just one piece of the bigger puzzle I want to put together. Now yeah, we still have. The philosophy oh, I've been God. analyzing this game with, just so that we're There's on the still same so page, much more. we can now start asking the question, why? Why would a gaster make a tangible device to connect our world to Deltarunes in the first place? Sure, I think something like that seems super interesting and a very cool way to manifest something as esoteric as suspension of disbelief in a narrative and mechanical context. But that's just the means. What are the ends? I mean, the ends could literally be... Why not? I mean, for all we've heard and all we've thought and all we've theorized about Gaster, we have absolutely no idea what the guy is actually like. We know he was at one point the royal scientist, if that actually was real. Because, you know, the whole thing with Undertale and Deltarune, you know, being connected and whatnot or not. Um, he might be, but for all we know, he very much could be one of those scientists that keeps pushing and pushing and pushing, trying to discover more and more and more until something breaks. I mean, the, I mean, for, uh, lest we forget, he literally disappeared from the original, um, Undertale, like, universe, uh, because he fell into one of his machines. And supposedly, you'd only be able to disappear from reality by falling into a machine if said machine had something to do with altering or tampering or jumping out of reality in the first place. His only problem was that he jumped out of reality in an uncontrolled fashion. What is the goal behind all of this? Well, to start, we- I have one word. <laughs> SCIENCE! <laughs> you have to go back to the very beginning of Deltarune's rollout. We don't know much about his motivations, other than the very unlikely conclusion that Deltarune is the experiment he was referring to in Entry 17, and that he mentions wanting to create a new future with the player by connecting to them. That is the extent to why he even made this device or program that we are aware of. He has a plan to make a new future, and it involves dark worlds and getting more fictional than fiction. See, the device theory isn't just my take on how the game's meta narrative is structured. It's not even a theory in the sense that I'm trying to make an educated guess about the future of the game. It's a theory about the very mentality to which I think Deltrun has been designed. If everything I have said so far is to be true, then we can use this theory as a basis to actually understand the meta narrative and its themes much more intimately, and perhaps even gauge what Gaster's motivations and intentions behind his experiments actually are. And to do that, I have just the thing to bring back from the beginning of this series. Back in part 1, before I actually went over the 2018 demo of Deltarune, I dedicated a chunk of this series to going back to Undertale for a bit. To not only analyze what we learned of Gaster in Undertale, but to dissect what it was exactly about Undertale that made its meta narrative work, or what made it click. Through this, I came up with a little something known as the unofficial Three Essentials of Toby Fox Meta Narrative which in short, boiled down to there needing to be mechanics that were diegetic to the game, a clear separation between player and protagonist, and at least one character aside from the protagonist that functioned as a living testament to the game's message. Okay. Using just those three essentials, I was able to boil down at least a solid chunk of what Undertale's intended message likely was. And now that we have gotten this far, well, we have plenty more sections of this series to go. <laughs> Let's take these three essentials and finally apply them to Deltarune. And what's well, the mess we're going to get? That is, if it really were that simple. Oh, See, wonderful. this is not the first version of this video that I've written, or that I've even recorded. In the original version of this part, I was intending on jumping straight into these three essentials and having the rest of this part be pretty much just a long series of tangents about how I think each of them could be applied to Deltarune, and using the device theory as a solid foundation or reference point to support my applications of those essentials. As, as you I do. grew to learn over time, I struggled a lot with really putting it all together. I could apply them just fine, but 
the glue wasn't there. Even with me applying everything and knowing what the pieces were, I just couldn't figure out how this was all supposed to really connect thematically. Something still felt like it was missing, but as I was working on the second part, and more particularly got around to doing the intermission bit where I realized that Deltarune's themes can go a lot deeper than just escapism, and seeing how that actually intertwined perfectly with how I was applying those three essentials, I realized something. There was actually a secret fourth essential. And oh no, the zero. Any of these three. One that I didn't notice when analyzing Undertale because I never had to ask this question when the themes were so much more apparent, and when the game's message was already complete, compared to a game that is still yet to reveal everything that it wants to say. Still very so, incomplete, let me yeah. Move this next section, a little impromptu amendment to these essentials. We need to understand not just how the game's meta narrative is structured, but what elements actually exist so far in the story that warrant it being structured in that way. And to do that, we need to examine the game's story and themes, and I'd say most importantly, the game's characters, to find some common threads and connections that justify the meta narrative being structured in the way that it is. So before actually going into analyzing everything in this game that I could say is diegetic, let's introduce a new essential to the table. Any given meta narrative element in the game must be demonstrative of a core theme of the game itself. In other words, we need to figure out what Deltarune's themes actually are. Now, going into thematic discussion yeah, is always going to be a bit even about? shaky, because no single interpretation of Deltarune, or any media, is going to be all-encompassing of everything that it could be trying to say, especially in Deltarune's case, where the game isn't even done yet. But I think what the- Not even halfway done yet! Again, I, once I said- What was that? I said it was like 28 and a half percent done, basically, at this point? The first few chapters alone, and with what the main characters have shown so far to the story, there is already so much to unpack thematically for Deltarune that I think we can at least start getting something of a solid picture for what the game is going to generally touch upon in the theming. For this section, we're going to find every theme in Deltarune that seems substantially relevant to the story and potential message, and dissect each of them and how they're applied to the game, so that we can understand the general direction that Deltarune's plot is headed towards. In doing this, it should help us not only identify things like the separation between player and protagonist and what is diegetic to the game, but also narrow down what is actually important to take away from those things. Undertale had plenty of nuances to what was diegetic in it, but I bet when you think of it in Undertale, you're mostly thinking of stuff like saving and loading, or resetting, or fading emotional investment. Not yeah. necessarily the more specific things, like the game window name changing, or Gerson using his shopkeeper status to be rendered impossible to battle. Oh god, I still remember that. That was absolutely awesome. Oh god, you know I just thought of... This reminds me, you know, the whole thing of, you know, games messing with you. And I, th and I think I, I partially missed out, or didn't show it properly when I or, uh, played it on my channel, because I was recording it wrong, but... Um, I think it was one shot. Yeah, that was it. In that game, there were a couple of times where the game itself really messes with your computer. Like, there was one puzzle that you can only beat because it changes, like, your uh, your background, like, uh, your desktop background as, as you're doing it. There's another time, like, one, I think it was the ending I got, where you have the main character, the little cat person. They literally walk off the game screen onto your desktop and out the window. I... <laughs> that was years ago. Can you imagine what somebody like Toby Fox could do? Like, having... Uh, like having like Omega Snowy or something like literally like peer out from the side of your desktop or something like that And that's how the boss happens. Oh, oh god the fourth wall breaking boss battle stuff like that. Oh mm, That would be awesome by forcing ourselves to connect each piece to an actual theme present in the game, it'll help us understand not just everything that seems irrelevant to the meta narrative with no rhyme or reason, but why those things matter and what specifically matters most so that we don't get lost trying to put everything together at once. So with that in mind, let's start with the thematic elephant in the room that I believe acts as the nexus of everything that Deltarin stands for. Escapism and how we interact with fiction. 
At this point in the series, okay. it really goes without saying how important this theme is to the game. It's so important I couldn't even get past the first section of this part without at least mentioning it in order to explain the device theory. Yeah, no matter yeah, what definitely. You look at it, Delterin's story is fundamentally built on exploring how people interact with fiction and the nuances of escapism as a result of that. And if my own insane idea of how the meta narrative is structured around deconstructing this theme isn't enough, just look at the symbolism and the game that ends up being attributed to fiction anyway. A surprisingly staggering amount of stuff in this game ends up tying back to interacting with and creating fiction as a concept. There's fictional media that's present within Deltarune, of course, and how the game uses its own fiction to allude to itself via mm -hmm. things like dragon blazers, cat petters, and even some of the things that darkeners represent. On several occasions, the scheme has used dragon blazers as a parallel to itself, both in gameplay and in potential narrative. And that's not even going to how it's implied to closely resemble the battle system and gameplay of the Dark Worlds. Which, speaking of, fiction in this game is a fucking spiderweb of different <laughs> ideas that all tie back to it. Obviously, we have the Blaine connection between fiction and darkness as a concept. The Dark Worlds, while indeed having some sort of impact on the Light World and Lightners in general, are rooted in some element of playing along with it or using your own imagination. It's more self-aware of its own fictional nature, and the way Escapism. that the Dark Worlds are treated, even by Rouse, is not too unlike how fiction in real life is treated. It's a nice escape from harsher realities and lets us explore some deeper topics and understand ourselves as people more intimately, giving us a window to not only make sense of our own struggles, but to grow bonds with others through interacting with it. But, of course, it's treated with moderation. Rousey, for instance, when he hears about Chris and Susie needing to go do their group project, does command them to go do it before returning to Castletown. I swear, that face. And need I mention how Rousey shuts down the idea of making a dark fountain within the cyber world, and how the Roaring is some kind of thematic manifestation of the consequences for engaging too deeply with fiction, while letting reality completely slip away from you. Jeez, I, I mean, that could... I mean, I'm not... I was literally about to try to come up with examples of that, but you, I think anybody can think of a near infinite number of examples of people getting a little too into, into like, their fiction. <sighs> and even the Dark Fountains themselves play well into their connection with fiction fundamentally, given how they appear in the light world. Yeah. Having something emit darkness should be physically impossible. After all, darkness is simply the absence of light. It itself doesn't spread like light would. The concept alone of something emitting darkness is otherworldly. It Which actually, thinking about it, do you think that in the Dark Worlds there actually is such a thing as the speed of darkness? Because, you know, there's... Because, the, of course, you know, there's a speed of light, and I know I've heard people argue before, oh, the speed of dark is even faster than the speed of light. Ugh. But if you have something that's literally creating darkness as a... as, like, a tangible thing... Something that's like the antithesis of like a photon or something. Like, how fast is darkness? Is it just like the same speed as light, but it's overpowered by the light? So you only actually notice it when like light isn't there? It's unreal, which is why it works so well in conjunction with fiction as a theme and why it just works in general for the game's design. Even in Entry 17, which all but directly refers to Dark Worlds, this is touched on, with the line, Photon reading is negative. Of course, that could just be interpreted as the absence of light, as that's just what photons are. Yeah, light. light. But given how Dark Worlds work in Deltarune, are you really going to tell me that it being interpreted as Gaster finding negative photons, or photons that emit darkness, was somehow completely not the intention? We have negative photons. I was going to say anti-photons, but that would just mean it's antimatter and would destroy anything it touches. I don't know, I've seen people be picky about this line and what it really means, but given it's clearly alluding to Deltarun, which Gaster's existence in Undertale pretty much is a giant mass of foreshadowing terror <laughs> anyway, I would honestly find it a bit strange if the intended interpretation wasn't that Gaster discovered the inherently unreal concept of photons that emit darkness. And I feel or that's only negative photons or anti photons, whatever you want to call them. Entry 17 with the whole dark, darker yet darker bit. This is something that not only is directly quoted by Sham after defeating Jevil, both of which we know had interacted with, or at least had been influenced by Gaster in some way, but it's even referenced on the chair page of the sweepstakes. Right, but yeah, what the if chair. it could get darker than dark? Or, if I were to look at the other meaning of this, clearly alluding to the idea of something being more fictional than fiction. After just two chapters, the game has already entertained the question of what would happen if you made a dark world within a dark world. And when you think about the theme of escapism, to me at least, it's
It seems like one of the only natural ways to take this theme further and drive home the risks of escapism, even if in a potentially very surreal and insane way. Oh god, I can't- I can only imagine what a dark world- well, not only, like, whatever apparent weirdness is created from a dark world itself, but you have a dark world created in a dark world where that second dark world is created by bird life, all people. Furthermore, the dark worlds themselves, as I said before, function like their own games within the game. The two worlds so far that we know for certain to be made by the Knight, for instance, have a rather similar way of playing them beyond unique overworld or enemy gimmicks, and also act like their own genres of fiction, taking place in completely different settings. Castletown could even be seen as an allegory for taking inspiration from different pieces of fiction, given how you recruit darkness to send them to Castletown and eventually evolve and build upon it compared to the style it took on at the beginning of the game. Castletown is fanfiction, you heard it here first! The will of the Fountain's creator even plays into this, the Dark Worlds being the stories themselves, why the creator is, in this metaphor to fiction, the author of those stories. That does, well, isn't that literally what I said earlier about the whole thing of, like, the potential reason why Darkners basically turn to stone if they're not in their own Dark World, where they're essentially cut off from their creator's creativity, in this case being, you know, the Dark Fountain. And if Chris is separate from the Knight, then it would make Chapter 3 seemingly different and more gimmicky or unusual style of gameplay make all the more sense. I could go on and on... And on, frankly. That, that's just it. Chapter 3 itself is going to be fanfiction of chapters 1 and 2 because uh, Chris is making his own version. I'm certain there is plenty of things about this comparison between darkness and fiction that I still haven't addressed. But I'll just say that if you want a really deeper look at just how complex these two ideas end up becoming when intertwined with each other, there's another video about the game's meta narrative by Redhead DJ that really touches on the lore, narrative, and character side of it, especially That's thoroughly. That's gonna have to be something in else I watch, isn't it? Great. His video definitely breathes some fresh air of its own into discussing the meta narrative and even opened my eye to some things about it that I hadn't thought too much about before, such as how the recruit system may play into this theme of engaging with fiction. But darkness is just one part of it. Another huge outlet that this theme of escapism and fiction is expressed through is... Water? The ocean. Or water in general. It's one of the more bizarre connections to this theme, but it pops up a surprising amount in some sometimes rather unexpected places. The Garner Maker background, for instance, which is based off of this sprite, known as Image Depth, is clearly oh. an image of just water. And it's even used for the background of the Dark Fountains themselves when you go to seal them. A lot of the language associated with and in Dark Worlds also relates to this. When Chris and Susie first fall into the closet Dark World, before it cuts to Chris waking up in the cliffs, you hear what sounds like water or the ocean. There's whatever's happening with Onion Sun in Onion Town, sand, with right. hearing some kind of song coming from the sea, which also alludes to Waterfall and the river person. Oh and god, speaking yeah. speaking of Waterfall, going back to the chair page, the sound that plays when it shows the more distorted animation of the chair is just a modified version of one of the ambient sounds used in a few rooms in Waterfall. Even stuff as minute as Jevil's dialogue, like how at the end of his fight he can allude to the Queen by saying that Hell's war bubbles from the depths, is language that, to me at least, does evoke imagery so of water. water. And the Depths even became a really popular theory for what could happen if you go darker than dark in Deltarin as a result. I mean, fuck, yeah. it's in the name of one of the main terms involving dark worlds, the Dark Fountains. Yeah, Referring exactly, to right there, okay. something of a fluid spewing out from a source, or if we wanted to reach, Entry 17. The darkness keeps growing, as if it's coming from a faucet or some running tap that's just flooding the whole space with it. And it seems like such a bizarre theme to keep throwing in, doesn't it? What does water have to do with darkness, or let alone fiction? I mean, you go deep enough, light can't penetrate it. I mean, I've seen it a couple times. I've seen it in a couple of those videos where they'll have like, a, like a bunch of things that are just random colors, you know, basically the entire rainbow, and they'll bring them deeper and deeper into the water. And as they go deeper and deeper, you see as certain colors fade out before other ones, while other ones are still pretty, like, eh, 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 not vivid, but like noticeable and discernible, while other ones basically just turn into black way before others. And it's because, you know, light's having to go through every single one of those water molecules and water is a, doesn't transmute light as well as air. I mean, that's literally the reason why the sky is blue. 
It's because uh, it's because of the light refracting through air. I think it's the nitrogen or something, if I remember correctly. And the reason why, you know, sunsets and sunrises are generally orange is because the light having to get to you has to go through a lot more air. If I remember correctly, I think I remember seeing like a science experiment you can do uh, like this yourself, where you take like, a, like one of those long rectangular fish tanks filled with water, and then you just start slowly dripping milk into it. And as like, uh, and as like uh, the water becomes more and more clouded, if you shine a light through it, you'll see the light slowly turn more orange as you add more and more milk uh, into the water to make it more cloudy. Because you know the light's being blocked uh, by more and more stuff in the water. And and that is it for now, unfortunately. This is of course a part of a much larger reaction, so Link to the Next Part should be appearing you know somewhere over my face as well as uh, in the corner of the video. I hope you guys liked, if you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not, and I'll see you in the next part. See ya!